Hello everyone, welcome to our presentation entitled When Safety Instrument Control Goes Rogue. This presentation is about logic project number 12, safety instrumentation and management. Before we begin, we note that logic would like to thank the participants in this project, including the US Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology Directorate, and participants that we cannot name here, which includes the participating vendors, the project test team, uh, logic member representatives and others. We should also note that the work performed on this project by SRI International was funded by the US Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology Directorate, and that the opinions, findings, conclusions and recommendations expressed in this material are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of DHS and should not be interpreted as necessarily representing the official policies or endorsements, either expressed or implied by DHS or the US government. My name is Ulf Lindqvist and I'm a senior technical director in the Computer Science Laboratory at SRI International. SRI is an independent non-profit research institute. I'm joined today by my colleague Laura Tinnell, who is a senior computer scientist at SRI, and she was the technical lead for Logic Project 12. Before we talk about Logic Project 12, we will give you some background on Logic. Logic is a collaboration between the oil and gas industry and DHS Science and Technology and it's focused on cybersecurity for industry control systems. The name LOGIC stands for Linking the Oil and Gas Industry to Improve Cybersecurity. LOGIC is a partnership between government and industry that is focused on collaborative research and development aimed at improving the security for the control systems used in the petroleum sector. The LOGIC model has been used by other industry government partnership groups. Let me say a few words about the structure and key players of LOGIC. The Automation Federation serves as the LOGIC host organization. Your presenters today are from SRI International, which has been contracted by DHS Science and Technology to provide scientific and technical guidance for LOGIC. The LOGIC member companies are large oil and gas companies that operate significant global energy infrastructure. This group includes BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Shell and Total. This timeline shows the projects that Logic has completed on a variety of technical topics. The public reports and presentations from these projects are available on the Logic website. As you can see, Logic has conducted roughly one project per year. 2009 to 2011, Logic conducted a project on SIS or Safety Instrumented Systems. And about seven years later, Logic revisited the SIS topic in project number 11. I will now hand over to my colleague Laura Tinnell, who will talk about Logic project 12 on instruments or safety instrumentation and management. Thanks, Ulf. Let's now dive into project 12 and find out how safety instrument control can go rogue and what can happen as a result. Project 12 built upon project 11 which investigated the security of safety instrumented system architectures commonly found in the oil and gas sector. Project 11 focused specifically on ways to attack SISs. In contrast, Project 12 focused on the instruments that produce the measurements used by an SIS logic solver and on the systems used to manage those instruments. Instruments have evolved and been modernized over time to provide smart features, such as partial stroke testing for valves. Logic wanted to understand if and how this modernization could be used by attackers to affect safety system operation. Today, we are going to talk about the results of Project 12. The project wanted to understand how malicious actors can use the HART protocol to control safety instruments in a way that could result in a safety system failing to perform its function. The project conducted four individual assessments and found multiple consequential issues that recurred across all assessments. All vulnerabilities that we will discuss today stem from typical issues that are included in the MITRE Common Weakness Enumeration. And it is in our judgment that if cybersecurity best practices were being followed, most of these issues would not even exist. Attackers can use these vulnerabilities to make harmful changes at will and in many cases, evade detection while doing so. This is due to a combination of supply chain issues and a lack of sufficient device protections. 
we found no single countermeasure to stop all of these attacks. Multiple defenses must be used that include technology solutions and policies and procedures. Project 12 presents a roadmap of short, mid, and long-term actions that can be taken to significantly reduce industry-wide risk. Today, we will briefly discuss some of the background on the project and our methodology. We will spend most of our time discussing the results and our recommendations. At the end, we will draw some conclusions that we hope will help the broader community moving forward. First, some project background. The project followed an overall methodology as is shown in this diagram. We will use this diagram to guide our discussion and refer back to it periodically. The first three boxes essentially define the project. We started with a question to answer. This was our objective. Then we did some background research and formed a hypothesis. Finally, we formed a series of questions to answer that could be used to prove or disprove the hypothesis. The instrument or asset management system is a trusted component in a safety system. Project 12 sought to understand an attacker's ability to compromise this platform and then use it to affect safety instrument function. The attacker in this case could have direct console access, as in the case of an insider, implant malware on the IMS platform, or remotely control it from elsewhere on the network. For the purposes of our assessments, attacks originated from this platform or were targeted at the communications between this platform and the instruments. Of special note here is that the project was not a traditional risk assessment. The project did not attempt to compute risk using any kind of standard risk equation. And the reason is that calculating a risk score would be meaningless without the context of the environment where the instruments are being used. Standard risk equations require understanding impact, and that impact is unique to the processes that depend on the instruments. Project 12 instead focused on trying to understand what is possible, what is the threat. Individual asset owners can and should take the information from Project 12 and use that to understand their own risk. In order to conduct Project 12, we first had to do a bit of research. First, we needed to identify common safety system architectures used in the oil and gas sector. Since Project 11 focused on exactly that, we simply adopted the Project 11 architectures. The two architectures are shown here. The first is labeled SIS mediated. The second is labeled MUX mediated. By mediated, we simply mean the component through which the management platform communicates with the instruments. In the first case, all communications flow through the SIS. In the second case, the SIS is integrated with the DCS and is not connected to the network, so the management platform can't even talk to it. Instead, the management platform talks to the instruments through a MUX over a serial connection. Next, we needed to identify commonly used instrument types. We wanted to make sure we had a good representative set of instruments for our testing. Here, we reached out to the logic members who identified three classes of instruments, transmitters, fire and gas detectors, and smart valve positioners and solenoids. Then, we needed to identify products to use for each of these categories. This led to engaging vendors to participate. The identity of participating vendors and the specific products used are protected under logic non-disclosure agreement and will not be disclosed. Finally, we needed to understand the HART and HART IP protocol standards as these are used to communicate with the instruments. Our hypothesis was quite simple. An architecture in which an SIS mediates the communications between the management platforms and the devices can better mitigate device vulnerabilities than can an architecture where those same communications are mediated through a MUX. Answering these key questions in the context of each architecture would allow us to prove or disprove the hypothesis. Specifically, we wanted to know, can an attacker compromise the instrument management platform? Can the attacker gain administrative privilege on this platform or remotely control it? Can an attacker compromise the instrument management software or the system either from the host platform, Windows 10, for example, or remotely? Can an attacker intercept a safety instrument password through keystroke analysis or memory leakage or network sniffing or some other means? Can an attacker affect smart instruments by remotely controlling the management software using stolen credentials? 
Do they need administrative privilege to do this? Can an attacker affect smart instruments using a vulnerability exploit? Can an attacker change an instrument parameter to an unsafe setting while evading detection? And can an attacker bypass the instrument's physical lock or password and cause harm? Answering these key questions will help us understand the true threat posed by smart instruments and management to the safety system environment. Now we will briefly cover our assessment methodology. We designed four parallel independent assessment activities based on vendor participation. Let's take a closer look at how we approached each of the assessments. First, we planned and conducted each assessment using vendor engagement throughout the entire process. We collected data, analyzed results, drew conclusions, and considered mitigations. Any product-specific issues were reported directly to the appropriate vendors. We then created a final technical report for Logic members. Individual assessment technical reports are Logic confidential and will not be disclosed. Each assessment instantiated the SIS and MUX-mediated architectures using a different set of products. We needed to ensure that each assessment answered the same questions in a consistent manner. So to do this, we created a base test plan to be used by all assessments. This plan defined the roles, threat model, rules of engagement, etc. Test cases were formed specifically to answer the key questions previously discussed. We then created an assessment-specific test plan for each engagement using the base plan, and then we simply refined the test cases based on the products used and their unique features. The Project 12 threat model was consistent across all assessments. We considered an insider in an oil and gas company. Now, this could be someone who knowingly is working for some adversarial group or someone who is unknowingly a conduit for the attacker. This insider had physical access to the instrument management platform, but not to the actual instruments. The adversary did not, however, have inside access at any vendor company. They did not have access to source code, and they couldn't inject malware into firmware. However, they could create and distribute Trojan versions of any publicly available software. In addition, the adversary was able to procure used devices for hands-on analysis through secondhand markets. They could also access ICS certain other advisories and other public information. Finally, they could use any openly available pen testing tools, custom built attack tools, and any exploits found on the dark web. Project 12 was the most aggressive and largest project that Logic had ever taken on. Not only did it consist of multiple assessments, but each assessment consisted of multiple components that had to be assessed individually. We engaged two parallel teams of assessors, one focused on the instruments while the other focused on the instrument manager. Because MUXs are hard passed through devices and do not offer any protective features, the project treated the MUX mediated architecture as a baseline for what an attacker could do to an instrument from a remote computer when no protections are present. Findings from these two assessment activities were brought forward for testing in the SIS mediated environment. Here, SIS protective mechanisms were tested to determine which, if any, could block and or detect the attacks. Device hardware and software protections were tested in both environments. And now for our results. Upon completion of the individual assessments, a cross-assessment analysis was conducted to find common issues that occurred, regardless of which products were used. These are the results we will report now. The first issue we will discuss is with the HARP protocol. This is the protocol used to communicate with safety instruments over serial connections. HARP packets can be wrapped in HARP IP or other proprietary protocols to enable Ethernet-based communications using a device-mediating component, such as an SIS. HARP specifies common and universal device read and write commands. SISs are able to block device write commands while allowing read commands, and this is a good thing. HART also specifies undefined device-specific commands, but provides no means to differentiate between read and write. Without device-unique knowledge, blocking device-specific commands becomes an all-or-nothing proposition. Either you block all commands or no commands. The management platform user interface relies on read commands to update the display. But because of this, many asset owners may be hesitant to block device-specific commands. 
Card has no inherent security concepts, and it does not provide any common way to handle security-relevant actions, such as locking and unlocking devices or clearing log files. This makes it difficult to monitor for attempts to bypass what little protections there are. Finally, without any external protections, heart packets are easy for attackers to manipulate. During the assessments, we demonstrated changing heart commands while packets were in transit. We also injected new heart commands and changed the responses going to the instrument manager. Next, we'll cover safety instruments. Nearly all the tested devices used Heart 7. There were a few that used Heart 5. They all implemented common universal and device-specific Heart commands, but none of them implemented authentication, even though they could have used a device-specific command to do so. They all assumed that any valid Heart command received was legitimate and executed it, so there was no challenging to make sure that it came from a legitimate source. Because of this, Devices can be reconfigured by an attacker if not write protected. To do this, an attacker just has to send a valid heart command to the device. And they can do this at will. Here are some examples of the device commands we used in the assessments. Sometimes we would send a single command, sometimes we sent multiple commands back to back. So, for example, we sniffed a device's software based write protect passcode from the network traffic. Using the sniffed passcode, we sent a series of commands that first unlocked the device, then changed the passcode, then relocked the device. This effectively locked the operator out of the device. What can be done to individual devices depends entirely on the commands they implement. Command information is openly available on the internet. Here's the good news. Hardware-based write protections work. They were effective in preventing most unauthorized changes. The bad news is that two-thirds of sampled devices did not have hardware-based write protections. They implemented software-based protections. All software-based protections were bypassed in our testing. Let me repeat that. All software-based protections were bypassed in our testing, either by sniffing the passcode in unencrypted traffic or by guessing it. No device had any timeout for multiple failed unlock attempts as is normally used in password-based authentication. The other issue that we found is that write protections are implemented inconsistently even across same vendor products. In hardware, the switches may or may not have been easy to find and they operated differently. In software, write protection was implemented using device-specific commands. Every device that had software protection implemented it using a different command and sometimes those commands function differently. This can lead to operator confusion and accidentally leaving devices unprotected. Now let's talk about instrument DTMs and DDs. These are software plugins used by instrument managers for device control. Device descriptions, or DDs, contain configuration files and provide basic controls. Device type managers, or DTMs, contain configuration files and executable code. They provide enhanced controls. DDs and DTMs are typically provided by instrument vendors and are downloadable from their product pages. Our assessment revealed that most of these are openly downloadable, sometimes in clear text. This gives opportunity to modify a DD or DTM during download. None have verified publishers that are checked during installation time. If an attacker were to place a Trojan DD or DTM installer on a vendor page, you might just not notice when you go to install it since the legitimate plugins are unverified anyway. Another thing we found is that only 22% had signed DLLs to prevent modification. So even after being installed, if malware were to get on the machine and change the DLL in some way, you would never notice. Finally, another 22% were written in a way that facilitated source code extraction for reverse engineering. This makes it easier to create a Trojan. DD and DTM installers require administrative privilege to write their contents to disk. This means that anything contained in the install package automatically inherits administrative privilege. This is one way we were able to answer the key question about whether attackers could get administrative privilege on the instrument management platform. The answer is yes. Malicious software packages can install malware that executes as a co-resident process on the system. This can include rootkits and other advanced persistent threats. 
Packages can also install Trojan DLLs that can be loaded and run as part of the instrument manager process. This allows the Trojan to inherit any permissions the manager process has and become part of the trusted platform. Packages can also install Trojan configuration files. While these aren't as concerning as executable code, we did demonstrate changing labels and values, which could lead a user to make incorrect changes. So why are Trojan DLLs possible in this environment? All tested instrument management solutions loaded DTMs and DDs without first checking their integrity. Even if they tried, most product DTM and DD files were not signed, so verifying the integrity was impossible. By using Trojan DDs and DTMs, we were able to make unauthorized changes to 78% of tested devices when no non-bypassable write protections were in place. That means if there was only software-based protections, we could bypass them and make changes using Trojan DDs and DTMs. Now, device hardware-based write protections block these attacks, and that's a good thing. And SIS protections also helped. Most SISs tested were able to prevent attacks that used heart, common, and universal commands. Attacks using device-specific commands were also blocked, but not without breaking the operator display. Now back to our key questions. What did we find out? 1. An attacker can compromise the instrument management platform. We demonstrated installing Trojan DLL and DD files on all assessed instrument and asset management solutions. 2. An attacker can gain administrative privilege on the platform. Administrative privilege is required to install a DTM in every solution tested, so installing a Trojan DTM gives an attacker the ability to run malware with administrative privilege on the host operating system. 3. An attacker can gain remote control of the instrument management platform. We demonstrated installing malware on instrument manager platforms and remotely controlling that malware. 4. An attacker can compromise the instrument manager software or system by installing a Trojan DTM or DD on the host platform. We also demonstrated installing Trojan instrument manager components through the operating system software install process. 5. An attacker can intercept safety instrument passwords through network sniffing, if the network traffic is not encrypted. We also demonstrated intercepting instrument passwords through keystroke analysis for 75% of instrument management solutions tested. 6. An attacker can make unauthorized device changes by remotely controlling the instrument manager. We demonstrated installing malware that listened for remote commands and made device changes on receipt. 7. An attacker can make unauthorized device changes by exploiting the lack of authorization checking before executing commands. No instrument vulnerability exploits such as buffer overflows were found given the limited scope and time of the assessment. 8. Attackers can change instrument parameters to unsafe settings and, in many cases, evade detection. Change logging in instrument manager solutions varied widely, with some providing almost no record of changes. Furthermore, devices support commands to wipe log files and reset the device change bit. These can be used by attackers to help cover their tracks. 9. We were unable to bypass any device physical lock. Only 33% of sampled devices had physical locks, though we were able to bypass 100% of software-implemented device write protections and cause harm. For example, we were able to cause instruments to send false reading to the SIS, force instruments into commissioning mode and send a specified value to the SIS, cause instruments to fail to execute authorized update commands, cause instruments to become unresponsive, change device passwords, and finally, lock operators out of using the devices. Of course, these were things we did with no device protections in the MUX mediated environment. But what about the SIS mediated environment? If you recall, we were trying to determine if an SIS mediated architecture could better mitigate device vulnerabilities than could a MUX mediated architecture. And the answer is true. SIS products provide additional protective features that if enabled, block many attack paths and thus reduce the risk of unauthorized device modification. Mux products do not provide these additional features. 
Of course, if the SIS features are not enabled, it provides no more protection than does a MUX. These SIS protective features are typically not enabled by default, which means they must be turned on. We observed that some features were not well documented or operated in a non-intuitive manner. This is why we recommend that asset owners talk directly with their SIS vendors to understand what protective features are available and how to implement them correctly. Let's talk for a moment about the SIS mediated architecture and the safety system communications. So the communications between the instrument management software and the instruments. Of course, the instruments talk heart, but the instrument manager talks over an IP-based network. So all the IP-based communications were implemented using either heart IP or vendor proprietary protocols. And by default, all of these protocols were clear text. Now, as mentioned before, SIS solutions offer additional protective features. And here we found that some SISs offer encrypted communications. In most cases, when we used unencrypted communications, we were able to hijack the communications in one or both directions. And this allowed us to modify device commands in transit. And my favorite was sending false information back to the instrument manager so that the operator saw the wrong thing. Enabling encrypted communications between the SIS and the instrument manager stopped these attacks when launched from points on the network. Now, network access is not actually required to do this. The same thing can be done using malware on the management platform, depending on how the encryption is implemented. So in host layer encryption, the data is decrypted before it is passed to the instrument manager. So any co-resident malware has opportunity to intercept and inject into that data stream. But when using application layer encryption, for example, TLS, the data stays protected until it reaches the instrument manager. It is decrypted in the manager's process space. This makes it more difficult for co-resident malware to affect the confidentiality or integrity of the data. In summary, we found that the heart protocol used by safety instruments is inherently insecure. Attackers can make unauthorized and potentially harmful changes to devices when hardware write protection is not used. All software write protections are bypassable, and devices do not authenticate the sources of the heart commands they receive. The industry practice of DTM and DD distribution provides a rich attack path for adversaries to install malware right on the trusted management platform. This malware can then take advantage of the instrument manager's trust relationship with the SIS or MUX to launch potentially disastrous attacks against the safety system. We cannot sufficiently emphasize the severity of this vulnerability. SIS solutions have protective features that can significantly reduce the risk of unauthorized device modifications over that of a MUX-based solution. However, these features must be enabled manually. Our goal is not to scare people. Rather, we want to help asset owners understand their real threats and what countermeasures they can use to manage their own risk. The Project 12 report provides a mitigation roadmap to help with this. Short-term mitigations focus on the things that asset owners can do immediately that will have a significant positive impact on their risk. For example, use hardware write protections. Follow good cyber hygiene and apply cybersecurity best practices to protect the instrument manager platform. And exercise safe handling of all DTM and DD packages that you get from vendors. Midterm mitigations focus on things that asset owners can do cooperatively with vendors. For example, asset owners should work with their SIS vendors to apply existing SIS protections that will reduce available attack paths. They should also work with vendors to implement robust monitoring. They should engage cybersecurity experts to work hand-in-hand -hand with them to understand their residual risk, create security policies and procedures that address any gaps in the technology solutions, and then train their staff on these policies and procedures. Longer-term mitigations focus on refining standards to require stronger assurances against cyber attack and on improving products and deploying into the industry. For example, in July 2020, the FieldCom Group released a new secure hard IP standard that encrypts network traffic at the application layer. 
This is a great first step, and vendors should consider implementing this standard in their products. We encourage the FieldCom group to continue and to revise the HARP protocol standard to include a means to differentiate between device-specific read and write commands. This will enable SIS solutions to block all write commands while still permitting device status to be read. We also recommend developing a standard set of security-relevant commands, such as clearing log files and unlocking devices. This will help with monitoring for attempts to bypass device protections. Finally, all product vendors should use software analysis tools to find and remove software product bugs that can lead to compromise. This will reduce vulnerabilities in the safety system environment by removing potential attack paths. As a reminder, malware can be installed on a machine in any of a number of ways. For example, if the machine has network connectivity, you might think you're connecting to a vendor site, but instead you connect to a malicious site and inadvertently download malware onto the machine. If the machine is air-gapped, and by that I mean it's not connected to any network, you might bring malware in on removable media when updating antivirus signatures, DTMs, and other required software. This media can include USB sticks and DVDs. So it is really important to pay attention and have strong procedures that govern when and how connections can be made to the manager platform. The first and most important strategy to preventing unauthorized device modifications is to not allow device updates during normal operations. Place write protections as close to the device as possible. Use hardware-based write protections where they exist, but if you only have software-based write protections, do use them. Just use additional protections along with them, and only unblock these commands when device configurations must be modified. A second strategy to preventing unauthorized device modifications is to use a protective mediator between devices in the network. Block device write commands at the mediator. This includes common and universal write commands. Block device-specific commands when not using the instrument manager. This will reduce the window of opportunity when device updates can be made. Because SIS products have many of the needed protective features, we recommend using an SIS to mediate device communications. We recognize that there may be circumstances where an asset owner cannot use an SIS to mediate device communications, and they have to use a MUX. So if you're using an Ethernet-based MUX, you could consider placing a mediating firewall between the MUX and the network, and this will provide some level of protection. If you use a serial-based MUX like we did in the assessments, the instrument manager is the mediator and its protection is imperative. A third strategy to prevent unauthorized device modifications is to only permit authorized hosts and processes to send commands to devices. So require authentication to the device mediator by the connecting processor host. Block any unauthorized connection attempts to the device mediator. Encrypt communications between authorized hosts and the device mediator to prevent communications confidentiality and integrity attacks. A final thing to do to prevent unauthorized device modifications is to protect the instrument management platform. This is just as important as the previously mentioned strategies. This platform is a trusted component that can be used by adversaries to attack the safety system. Protect this platform using cybersecurity best practices. For example, use strong accountable authentication. Don't share passwords. Control access, including physical access to the machine. Don't leave it unattended where someone could walk by and insert a USB stick. Remove unneeded software. Software contains bugs that can provide attack paths into systems. Keep system patches and antivirus software up to date. If the platform is network connected, consider using a host-based firewall to block any inbound network connections. Consider also using an integrity checking product that will inform you of unexpected changes to system files and the registry. Always use good software installation practices. Handle all DTMs and DDs in a safe manner. Vet all of the existing plugins currently in use and where possible, use DDs instead of DTMs. Finally, only install new DTMs and DDs from trusted sources and verify the integrity of the files before installation. This last step will require working with the device vendors to get the cryptographic hashes you need in order to do this verification. 
Strategies to detect unauthorized device modifications include things like logging all connection attempts made to the device mediator and alerting on unauthorized sources, and logging all commands received that update device state and parameters. Because the instrument management platform can be compromised, we highly recommend implementing independent device state monitoring. Periodically pull device states and compare with expected states. Log an alert on any unexpected deltas. Also, compare found states with those shown on the Instrument Manager console and alarm if the results differ. This can trigger an investigation to determine the source of the problem. When we bring all these things together, it looks a bit like this picture. Here we have multiple layered attack prevention and detection mechanisms. We augment these technologies with policies and procedures to fill any gaps. The actual layers used may be different for each asset owner. Each organization must balance their own operational needs with the actual threat to their operations. It is our hope that by providing detailed results from Project 12, we can help arm people with the information they need to understand their own threats and to make educated decisions about what protections they will use. In summary, the Project 12 report lays out a mitigation roadmap of short, mid, and long-term actions. Short-term mitigations focus on things that asset owners can do immediately to reduce their risk. Mid-term mitigations focus on things that asset owners and vendors can do cooperatively. Long-term mitigations focus on refining standards to require stronger assurances against cyber attack and on improving products and deploying into industry. Well, we're almost done. It's now time for our conclusions. In summary, we found numerous consequential and reoccurring exploitable weaknesses across all four assessments. These are primarily due to four things. Unchecked heart pass through to devices. The evaluated heart and heart IP protocols have no built-in security concepts. Devices do not authenticate the source of heart commands before execution and the industry uses unverified third-party DTMs downloaded from the internet. This is an open invitation for a supply chain attack. The introduction of unverified third-party DTMs used by instrument management solutions poses a significant risk for platform compromise. Loading these software packages on the instrument manager platform bypasses any air gap and potentially places malware directly into the process control environment. This malware can then take advantage of the instrument manager's trust relationship with the SIS or MUX and the lack of device protections to launch attacks against the safety system and other systems connected to the process control network. This can cause the safety system to fail to perform its intended function. Worse, these attacks do not require a high degree of sophistication. Many of these attacks only require a low to moderate skill level. We cannot sufficiently emphasize the severity of this vulnerability. Simply put, attackers can make harmful changes at will and evade detection. Critically, we conclude that the safety environment is vulnerable to malicious attacks that may be undetectable in practice, and that extreme caution should be taken before introducing any software into this environment. The thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. We're not talking about zero-day software vulnerabilities here. All found issues are covered by the MITRE Common Weakness Enumeration for Architectures. These are commonplace findings when cybersecurity is not a primary consideration in design. If cybersecurity best practices were being followed, most of these issues would not even exist. What about available countermeasures? Given the current set of standards and products we sampled, we conclude that there isn't one single countermeasure that will prevent 100% of all attacks. Now, certainly some protections are better than others. Device hardware-based write protections provide the best protection, but 66% of sampled devices don't even have this. This points to the need for layered defenses. The Project 12 report contains a table of all countermeasures examined and how and where they work. This information can be useful to asset owners for planning out a protection strategy. For example, couple device write protection with blocking write commands at the SIS. This is a good idea even if all devices have hardware write protections. Why is that? Because humans make mistakes and can leave devices accidentally unprotected. By having multiple layers, 
If one layer fails, another layer will protect you. Ultimately, we must get to a point where we have safety systems that are robust not just to mechanical and hardware faults, but also to cyber attacks by concerted adversaries. This is going to require industry-wide changes. We must recognize that cybersecurity can affect reliability and safety. Again, if cybersecurity best practices were being followed, most of these issues would not exist. We can start here. Moving forward, we should consider cybersecurity as a first-class requirement in safety standards and engineering. Project 12 is a call to action. Asset owners need to act quickly and do the short-term things that can be immediately done to make a major difference in their risk. Vendors need to examine their own products and determine ways to shore them up. And standards bodies need to include cybersecurity principles in industry standards. As the saying goes, it takes a village. And here, it takes the whole ICS village. We cannot possibly cover the contents of the entire 40-page Project 12 report in this short talk. We encourage all asset owners, vendors, and standards bodies to download and read the report and to start a community-wide discussion on how we can, together, protect our safety systems.